Welcome everybody to Crystal Kyle and Friends. And today we are talking about a little thing that's called the State of the Union. Indeed. Yes. No friend today outside of, I guess, Joseph Robinette and Biden Jr. Yeah. So <laughs> then that is not a friend. That is very, very far from a friend indeed. It's not even a friend of me, just a villain at this point. Yeah. So um, I'll try my best to put my bias aside for this to... Uh, Grade him on the proper Biden curve. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. try to put my normie hat on a little bit here and yeah. and see how I think he did. Um, so what we're going to do is we'll do a general breakdown and then we'll dive into specific clips that uh, were the big moments from the night, if yeah. you will. Yeah. And I actually have thoughts that are all over the map on this. You okay. know, do you feel the same? Yeah, I don't think I've ever found it so difficult to put my uh, personal feelings about something aside than watching the speech because to me just like the horrors that were perpetrating in Gaza just kind of loom large over everything but that being said I will also try to put those emotions aside because I mean the only answer there isn't a speech it's to actually change your policy stop the bombing and uh, stop the genocide yeah I mean I mean I would argue it's a proper bias to have one should have an anti-genocide bias. I, I, it's like I the bare have, minimum thing. I do have a litmus test when it comes yeah. to uh, perpetrating genocide. Of so, course. Yes, I'm, yeah. I'm a purist like that. So um, so here's how the speech went. Here was the breakdown. And we could talk a little bit about beforehand there were massive protests that were blocking what they thought were going to be his route to the speech. Yeah. There were, I don't know if it was hundreds or thousands, but looking at the videos, it seemed like there were a lot of people out there, pro-Palestine folks who were like, screw you, we want to even block your route. And they went some back way or whatever and ended up getting there. Yeah. But right off the bat, the beginning of the night came in hot. It yeah. was spicy from the beginning. And it was significant because, I mean, obviously, I don't think they had any expectation that they would be able to keep him from doing the State of the Union. But they forced the mainstream networks while they're waiting for Biden to get there. They did make Biden late because he had to go some long way around to avoid these protests. And so the whole country is seeing those images first, and that's setting the context for this speech. And of course, you know, we've seen the reporting that basically he's afraid to campaign because he can't go anywhere without facing protests. We saw Adam Schiff get shouted down at his victory speech. We saw Kirsten Gillibrand and, you know, this conflict between the protesters and these old people are freaking out at the breach and decorum that you dare, you know, call for the end of a genocide. But I think every single Democratic politician, and Joe Biden in particular, is feeling that pressure because they know anywhere they go, people are going to show up to remind them of how outrageously immoral their policy is. So um, he started the speech with Ukraine, which is kind of a wild thing to start with, in my opinion. He quoted like FDR and maybe mentioned Lincoln or something. Yeah. And then you tried to link that to... We got to send Ukraine more money because Russia is going to take them over if we don't do that. Uh, then from there, he transitioned to uh, coming out against Trump for being a threat to democracy. Mm -hmm. uh, I was actually very surprised at how kind of forceful and aggressive the call outs were against Trump. Usually right. in these State of the Union speeches, you know, as I always say about Biden, he's perpetually stuck in 1993. And it's all this, you know, both sides type stuff and um, flowery language and we believe in freedom and liberty and justice and Americans can do anything. It's stuff like that. It's mm -hmm. not like my opponent's an asshole. He's way yeah. too extreme that you shouldn't even consider this dude because that makes no damn sense. Basically, that's what he was doing. He brought up January 6th and um, it was a very partisan part of the speech. But when I say that, I mean that actually in a positive sense. Yeah, I agree. You know, I mean, the Republicans were melting down over it and, and acting like this was a campaign speech and all that stuff. I mean, it was a campaign. It speech. was a campaign speech, but like he needed a campaign speech. Yeah. Right. It was better than just some vague flowery nonsense. That's like, you know, the classic like an Obama type speech. Right? Let's come together. You know, it, yeah. it's not time for that right now. Yeah. You saw those Biden instincts later in the speech when there was a line yes, in there calling correct. out Wall Street. And he was like, ad lib. We actually no, have that. Guys. We actually oh, yeah, have that play as one that of the later. Clips. Yeah. yeah. It's like, oh, my God. <laughs> but, um, you know, on the choice to start with Ukraine, not the choice I would have made, but it did have a logic to it. Because if you look at where his approval rating is highest issue by issue, Ukraine is actually number one. And so he feels like he's got kind of a strong hand to play there. And then he transitions into January 6th, which, which obviously, you know, is one of the things that I think people find most horrible about Trump, that he subjected the country to that and sat back while this was all happening and cited, et cetera, et cetera. And then he transitions into 
Roe versus Wade and IVF. IVF. Yep. And that was, he was hitting them hard. So he definitely front loaded with the areas that he felt were his strength. Now, again, with regard to Ukraine, um, I can't listen to his words about like democracy and human rights with, and, you know, his upset over Trump saying to Putin, do whatever the hell you want when Biden is out there telling Netanyahu and Gaza basically do whatever, whatever the hell you want. So again, I can't hear those words anymore about Ukraine and the international rules-based order and all of this without seeing how just completely morally bankrupt and full of shit they are. But, you know, I think for your average voter, the main thing they wanted from this speech wasn't a specific policy or to hit this area or to go after Trump. It was just, is this man literally capable of performing the duties of the job? Is he so mentally gone that he's unable to even pull it together for one hour to deliver a decent teleprompter speech? And I think the choice of coming out very aggressive was an attempt to show, hey, I still got it in me. I still got fight in me. I still got more to give. And I think just, you know, his his energy level, it, it's graded on like the biggest curve ever. The bar was literally on the floor. We're talking about he was able to get through a teleprompter speech and not have like a visible health event. But he pulled that off. He did pull that off. Well, I saw that at least on my Twitter trending thing, Adderall was trending. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's because he he was aggressive in the speech and he kept it together for the most part. Yeah. There were some moments. And again, we'll get to them. We actually have them in video. Mm -hmm. There's some parts where it was like, oh, the wheels are coming yeah. off. The bro. further you got into the speech, the more you're like, oh. But he was able to pull it back together in those instances. Yeah. And then he gave the media all that the media needed to that's go out right. there and be like the greatest speech of that's, all time that's right it's right. a historic speech that's like right. this that's what you know the morning joes of the world are gonna say yeah and so he lit he went through all the things that we discussed then he does a decent part on economics and raising taxes on the rich mm -hmm. then he goes to you know restoring the child tax credit then he hits the republicans on the whole border bill thing um that my, moment was awkward. We probably you have that to play, right? The immigration uh, piece. Yes, we yeah. do. We do have that to play. Um, and guys, by the way, sign up on Substack if you want to see the full thing. You're only going to get a part of it uh, if you're listening to the teaser clip on YouTube. Um, the worst part, in my opinion, the Israel and Gaza portion. It absolutely sucked. We have that as well. I'll explain in detail why it sucked. But overall, what I would say in the speech is I think the general aggression was good. I like the fact that he like really did kind of go for Trump's jugular, as they said, the campaign said, this is what we're going to try to do. Um, and that and the economics portions, I think were just flat out good. Yeah. He doesn't sound like Bill Clinton. He doesn't sound like Barack Obama when talking about economic stuff. He sounds more like Bernie on those issues. He's there talking was... about raising taxes on the billionaires and mm -hmm. making the corporations pay their fair share. And he has those moments, like you already pointed out, where he brings up Wall Street. He's like, they're not bad guys. <laughs> they're not bad guys, but they didn't build the middle class. He does this, <laughs> it's classic Biden thing. Yeah. And he brags about, I'm from Delaware, where there's more corporations than anywhere else in the world. Like, oh, he, something to really be proud of. Yeah, there. he does that. <laughs> but he does that to sort of soften the blow of basically being like, the middle class are the people who really do the shit, you know? So he did on the economic stuff. I think he actually did a good job. He even, I think it was smart for him to do the thing where he specifically called out shrinkflation. Yeah. Cause I feel like that's been an issue under his administration, not just inflation, but also shrinkflation. And he brings up Snickers bars to do it. He's like, we've all seen the thing where you got the package and <laughs> it's 10% less. <laughs> that's not okay. <laughs> he does it. And people, you could see like some normie watching that, like, yeah, that is sort of fucked up, isn't it? You know? <laughs> yeah, for sure. For sure. I mean, we were talking before the speech about how in a different timeline when he's not aiding and abetting and facilitating genocide, you know, we would be out there after a speech like this and, and really defending him because the economic pieces, you know, things that he actually has done in his administration, especially on antitrust, especially on labor. Sean Fain was there. He talked about the PRO Act, talked about the historic union drives. He's putting out there some, you know, specific things about what they're doing with regard to junk fees and shrinkflation and talked a good bit also about, you know, lowering prescription drug prices and about housing. I thought the housing piece was really solid and really good. Like there's a different timeline where we're actually, you know, very much encouraging people that this is not just a lesser of two evils, that there's a very notable difference in domestic policy between Trump 
and between Biden. But, you know, obviously he kind of killed that that vibe with the rest with his foreign policy. Yeah. So overall, I give it uh, a C plus. Um, maybe a B minus okay. if I'm being kind. Mm-hmm. Uh, but let's let's actually. Is that the, OK, let me ask you. Is that the absolute grade or is that the special Joe Bar- Biden grade? Like if Barack Obama gave the same performance, is it still a C plus B minus? Well, I mean, I find it. It's that's a good question. I find it. I find it almost impossible to not grade on a curve. I know. I'm grading Biden against Biden standards. Yes. Right. If I were to compare him, there's a million ways you can grade it. Like I can grade it against the platonic ideal of a president, in which case he gets an F minus minus. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I can compare it in terms of rhetoric to somebody like Barack Obama, in which case it's going to be a worse grade. Because yeah. Barack Obama just, he had a way of speaking where everybody just sort of cummed their pants when he talked. <laughs> right? So, like, if if I'm grading it, I feel like the most normy way to look at it, if I'm trying to be fair, is grading Biden in relation to Biden and what he can be at his best. Yeah. And, you know, I, to be fair, I didn't think it would be po- even possible for him to get a C plus or a B minus. Because I'm just like most people out there. I'm with the 86 or 90 percent of Americans who are like, this motherfucker, he ain't gonna make it four more years. Yeah. Right. So, relative to that, yeah, it's like a C plus or a B minus. Relative to Joe Biden of this moment, I actually give it even a little higher than that. For him right now, I actually give it a B plus because he did the thing he needed to do. You know, he needed to convince people that he had just like basic capability to hold it together. He needed to give them his media allies the ability to spin this as some wonderful oratory and Joe Biden's back and see he was underestimated all the all the time, blah, blah, blah. And to shut up the increasingly loud chatter and direct arguments from people like Ezra Klein and Nate Silver and others that he really needed to step aside. And he did that. So he accomplished what he needed to accomplish. Again, the broader problems that he has with uh, the base of the party in particular on Gaza. There's no speech that can fix that without a dramatic change in policy. So that was not really on the table to uh, to accomplish last night. But, you know, the piece that he could do, he did do. Um, Now, if this was Barack Obama and the performance was as it was last night, we'd be like, I think Barack Obama needs to see a doctor. I think there's something wrong with Barack Obama. You know, for him, it'd be like an F, right? So it is the biggest curve of all time. Or Bill Clinton, same thing, you know. But for Biden, at this moment in his life, at this moment in his presidency, I think this was the absolute best you could have possibly expected. Okay, so now uh, I'm going to jump around a little bit here on the clips in terms of, like, the chronological order of when it came out. Mm -hmm. So before anything... We'll get to the Biden clips, but I want to first show a piece of the Republican response. Okay. Because this, <laughs> holy shit. Well, I, I should, I want to say too, when I got back from the live stream last night, you know, we were busy doing the live stream reacting to just the Biden State of the Union. And the first thing you said to me when I came in was like, you got to see this Katie Brewer response. It was bad. And I had, have never seen anything like it. I, don't, I know people had all kinds of ways of describing this. I can't describe it. It is like nothing I've ever seen before. Okay, total dead-eyed psychopath. <laughs> this woman, cops need to go check this woman's basement because, <laughs> holy cow, you want to talk about one, one tweet I saw that I liked was, uh, holy first year of drama class, Batman, or something oh, like that. Because it, it looks like she's so like weird. she's like in seventh grade and she's told, now you need to show emotion when you're acting and really get into it. Speak slowly and enunciate and show a lot of emotion. Yeah. All right, so let's show everybody, then we'll react. Meanwhile, the Chinese Communist Party is undercutting America's workers. China is buying up our farmland spying on our military installations and spreading propaganda through the likes of TikTok. You see, the CCP knows that if it conquers the minds of our next generation, it conquers America. And what does President Biden do? Well, he bans TikTok for government employees, but creates an account for his own campaign. Y'all, you can't make this stuff up. Look, we all recall when presidents 
faced national security threats with strength and resolve. That seems like ancient history. Right now, our commander in chief is not in command. The free world deserves better than a dithering and diminished leader. Mr. President, you must stop it. I demand you do the right thing. It's like, and she tries to like go back and forth. She tries to switch emotions, yeah. like a light switch. Right. You know what I mean? She'll, she'll like calm down and start talking in a different way. It's like, what is it? There's something written in the laws of nature where the people who do the Republican response yeah. are absolute weirdo freaks. Totally. Bobby totally. Jindal. Classic yeah. Bobby Jindal. Oh, that was, I think this is up there with Bobby Jindal. I think it was that bad. Then and we, Jindal is historically bad. Then we went back and saw the Marco Rubio, where he's in the middle of talking. And that was hilarious. Guys, yeah, I'm, sure, I'm sure a lot of you in our audience remember it, but you got, go watch that Marco Rubio response. I don't remember the what funniest, year it was. The funniest thing, how he's taking these little furtive glances to, to the camera. He goes to sip the water, but he, <laughs> in his mind, he acts like, all right, let me shut off the fact that people are watching me. And I'm going to go take this real quick because if people can't see me, like he could have just been like, excuse me one second and then take a <laughs> sip of water, acting on some normal well, shit. And people be like, yeah, he was thirsty. But instead he. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and he had the mean cotton mouth leading up to it. And you oh, can hear you bad. can literally yeah, hear the cotton bad. mouth. It He's was like bad. I mean, when it's like that, you just have to acknowledge like I think the best thing to do in that situation is just acknowledge the fact that like. This is a big moment. I'm a little nervous. Let me just grab some water. You know what of I mean? Of course. Like, and I, and no one, everyone would be like, oh, of course. It's a big moment. He's nervous. That's normal. You know? But instead, you have to do, like, the least normal thing possible. You can turn it into <laughs> an endearing thing. Bobby Jindal. I wish we, I, I wish we actually had a clip of him because... That man was he was being billed as the next big Republican thing, presidential candidate, like this is the guy. He there ran. Are all these there are all these glowing pro oh, he's so smart and he really understands healthcare down to the nuts and bolts. And after he gave that response, that was it. That was mm. it. It was over. And it is a little similar with Katie Britt. The only thing is she she's new in the Senate. Um, she just got a like, I don't know, like two years ago or whatever. Anyway, she, people don't really know who she is. But in advance of this response, people were billing her like, oh, it's this, you know, this young woman. She's really up and coming. Like you might be hearing a lot more from her. Don't think so. No. <laughs> I do not think so. You were saying the Senate Republican Twitter account, rather than posting clips, they're just posting quotes from it. I mean, that tells you how bad now, it is. Now, to it's be fair, the, universally panned. The general GOP account was putting videos. She was putting videos on her own Twitter, right? But by the way, I read the replies. Woo! <laughs> Even the Republicans are like, yeah. I don't know about this fella. Well, I, mean, I, don't know, I don't know about this. Last mm -hmm. night when we were doing the live stream, Emily Jashinsky, who was on the right, kept looking at the uh, the tweets about Katie Britton. She's like, it looks like she's really bombing. It looks like this did oh, not go well. Bomb so, city, bro. <laughs> but even on the content there, she's acting like it is, he's about to spark World War Three because he has a campaign TikTok account. Like that was the substance of but what she was arguing there. this is what Republicans there. do, right? <laughs> this is what Republicans do. They take the dumbest possible criticisms of Biden and they make it seem like this is the biggest. It's like with the border thing, right? He gives them everything they want. And then they're like, why are you doing an open borders bill? Yeah. And it's like, you're just a fucking idiot at that point. If this is the kind of stuff that you're saying. Yeah, and then by the way, absolutely. afterwards, she took a picture with her family, which by the way, I feel terrible for those kids <laughs> that this, this absolute psychopath freak dragged them into a public public life and a public profile because yeah. took a picture with some teenage kids, right, or whatever, however old they are. And they took a picture in their kitchen. And as people pointed out, if you look around the kitchen, not a single thing is out. It's just like a totally blank kitchen. And people were like, where's the shit in your kitchen? You're trying to make it seem like I'm an every man. I'm, right. I'm the standard American, just like you. And then you're in some Stepford wife ass house <laughs> that looks like it's some AI generated picture. Right. It's a swing and a miss on every conceivable level. And by the way, as I pointed out, I don't understand why Trump is not the only one giving the response. He's the guy. We know he's the guy in the Republican party. Why are we pretending like this rando has any shot whatsoever? Forget 20, 2028 now. <laughs> 
dunsies for no, her. Oh, forget but about like, it. But like, why are we pretending like anybody else can be the person right now? Yeah. Trump was live tweeting his reaction to Joe Biden and shit posting and putting like face app filters on videos of Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. Like, I don't understand why he wasn't the one that they went to. I, I, I don't even know why they do these responses anymore. I know. Because they just don't go well. They're cursed. Even the ones, They're cursed. Even the ones that aren't like so surreal you can't even wrap your head around as this one was they're they're it's not like they do anything yeah it's, it's just forgettable uh, people don't really watch they don't really care they're like mildly awkward at best and politically catastrophic at worst there was remember there was a moment there for a while where it'd be like four different response oh there's the oh yeah, 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 yeah. the there's freedom the caucus response there's the freedom mm -hmm. caucus and there was like a whole you know whole buffet of responses mm -hmm, to pick mm -hmm. from but i think the the era of the you know excitement over the response is kind of over and so now it's more of a curse than a blessing to to get it used to be big honor to get picked to be yeah. the response now it's like signing your political death certif certificate but i'm also just looking at this part i'm like do you not have one normal person if you just picked one random person off the street to read this speech, it would have been way better well, than this weirdo. Even this woman's video pitching that she was going to do the response was 10 times more normal. Oh, really? Yeah. There's a video of her like, tune in when I give my response or and whatever. It was fine. I wouldn't say fine. Okay. <laughs> but I would say it's, we're, be we're it's way better. We're grading on the Katie Britt curve now. Yes. Way better <laughs> than what she ended up delivering. That's it. Who coached her and was like, this is great. You're nailing it. You know? And wasn't like, mm, maybe reel it in like 100%. You know the answer to this. They're surrounded by yes men and yes women. That's what it is. It's like you, it's the same with Biden with everything that's going on with him destroying Gaza. Like he's surrounded by people who are like, Mr. President, you really showed them. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like that's what it is. It's, it's sycophants who are just trying to get a paycheck. Yeah. And so nobody tells her like, just so you know, you look like a freak. Right. Like you look like nobody should listen to a word you say and they'd run away from you. Yeah. She makes Biden look fantastic in comparison. Oh, no doubt about that. <laughs> All right. So um, now... Let's uh, let's talk about one of the more controversial moments of the night. Okay. So this, of, co of course, referring to on the way in, Marjorie Taylor Greene was trying to get Joe Biden to take a, a pin mm -hmm. for Lake and Riley. Um, and this is somebody who was killed by an undocumented immigrant. And she was on that House floor with the... Uh, with the MAGA hat on, which people were, were like, that's a violation of the rules. That was Sagar. <laughs> yeah, Sagar was saying that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, and he, I guess he took it because when he was on the podium, she started screaming out, like, say her name or something like that. Mm -hmm. And then this moment happens. Take a look. I'd be a winner. Not really. I... Lincoln, Lincoln Riley, an innocent young woman who was killed by an illegal. That's right. But how many of thousands of people being killed by illegals? To her parents, I say, my heart goes out to you, having lost children myself. I understand. But look, if we change the dynamic at the border, people pay people, people pay these smugglers 8,000 bucks to get across the border because they know if they get by, if they get by and let into the country. All right, so a number of things to point out there. The the very beginning, I'd be a winner. Not really. <laughs> what was he talking about? Okay, there? I so here's <laughs> here's my guess as to what happened. Yeah. The I'd be a winner thing was on the the teleprompter in the context of something. Okay. But he hears Marjorie Taylor Greene screaming. Oh, that and then he's reacting off, to that. And then he's kind of reacting to that. But it makes it, it's very bad optics. And by the way, Marjorie Taylor Greene, you absolute fucking moron. If you just step aside right there and let him go, that's going to be the moment where he trips over his dick. Right. I, I warned you about this before. I was like, so, yeah. somebody's going to make some noise. Yeah. It's going to throw him off. He's going to lose his place in the teleprompter. And then boom, you get your Biden moment that all of them want. And she couldn't help but stay involved in the interaction and then g giving him a chance to kind of get out of it. Right. But now let's talk about the heart of it. So, well, one second. So I found the place in the, cause they, they released the remarks as prepared for delivery. So what he was supposed to say about the border bill was it's not about him or me. 
it would be a winner for mm. America. My Republican so friends, you owe it to the American people to get this bill done. And so, yeah, he misread it. He said, I'd be a winner. And then he realizes, like, that doesn't make any sense. But she kind of got him off. Yeah. Yeah. She, by her interrupting, it made it, it to threw that, him off. It, right. Yes. So, um, so the part that a lot of Democrats are pissed at is yeah. that he said, you know, he mispronounced her name, by the way. He said Lincoln Riley. Yeah. Lincoln Riley. Right. Um, but they're mad that he said, called the person that killed Lake and Riley an illegal. She was killed by an illegal. To me, this was the least surprising thing Biden has ever said. Yeah. Because as I always tell everybody, he's perpetually stuck in 1993. And in his vernacular, illegal immigrant is, they honestly were lucky he didn't say illegal alien. Yeah. Because that was the vernacular until like, what, 2000? Yeah. 2006? Something like that. And so that part to me was not surprising. It's not surprising. It's it's actually, it's just a little bit of a mask slip. I, I saw uh, somebody commenting on Twitter. If you went back and listened to the way Joe Biden and every other Democrat was talking about immigration. Obama did too. In the No, no, no. I'm talking about in 2019. Oh, 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 oh. Okay. When they were, you know, really, remember when they were all like speaking high, their high school Spanish on the stage and they were talking in only terms of compassion. And then you showed this where he's just blurting out, like, killed by an illegal. Um, it's jarring the difference between how he postured during the campaign versus how he's governing now. Um, so, I mean, it's it's perfect. It's perfectly emblematic of the Democratic Party that of everything in that speech. And especially when you consider, you know, the Gaza piece, that what they're upset about is just like this word that he used uh, to describe an uh, illegal immigrant or an undocumented immigrant, like that they would parse over the language more than the substance is a, a perfect example of, you know, how weirdly obsessive the Democratic Party has gotten over language specifically. But the policy also really sucks. And it's and it's both immoral and it's also politically nonsensical. Because on the one hand, they want to argue like, oh, Donald Trump is going to do fascism at the border. You can't elect him. And on the other hand, he wants to go out and be like, hey, Donald Trump, work, work with me with on me the border. On this. Yeah, no, I've, I've pointed that out, too. There is a there's it's a massive contradiction. It yeah. makes absolutely no sense. And you've just completely caved to the Republican narrative about immigrants, about immigration and about the border. You but just accepted their th framing. But this is what he's always believed. Yeah, oh, absolutely. This is, and this is this what is the, the real thing. The the 2020 version was the departure. So, yeah. So honestly, I don't understand. Everybody's being very Pollyanna-ish about this. And it's like, you guys don't know this is Joe Biden's opinion. There's videos of Joe Biden in the 1990s talking about how we need to build a giant barrier at the southern border. He was for Trump's wall before Trump was for his own wall. OK, this is who he is. What was Obama's nickname when he was president? Deporter in chief. The deporter in chief. Well, who was his vice president? Mm -hmm. You think Biden has clean hands? You think he didn't have any idea what was going on? Mm -hmm. This is who he's been. Okay. So, I, you know, I'm, I'm not surprised by it at all. But it's amazing to me that the language where, when he says illegal and illegal, that's a bigger scandal to a lot of these Democrats than the part, portion on Gaza which is him running cover for a fucking genocide. Right. And that, to that, I would say, you, your priorities are wrong. If that's your, you're just wrong. If that's your reaction to it. Especially because the rest of the sentence, this part is annoying me. Because people are not actually taking his full sentence in, in its full context. Because he goes on to say, how many thousands of people are killed by legals? Right. In other words, yes, he used an illegal, but it was in the context of actually defending undocumented immigrants right right and everybody's acting like that's not what he was doing that is what he was doing he was saying effectively that there's a higher crime rate among uh naturalized citizens and natural born citizens you know co uh, compared to undocumented immigrants and documented immigrants by the way yeah so that's a fact and he's pointing that out but people are so caught up on the language that they're refusing to even acknowledge that the point he was making was actually a correct point it was a correct point but it was very awkwardly made. It's, it's it was Joe very Biden, awkwardly of made. Because, like, you and I know what he meant because we know the statistics. We know that the native born population is commits more crimes than the undocumented population. We know how grotesque it is that these, you know, these instances of violence from the undocumented immigrants, that those are used to smear every immigrant as some sort of violent 
immoral criminal. We know all of those pieces. So when we hear him say that, we're like, oh, this is what he means. But it was uh, when he's delivering it, it was definitely one of those moments where I was like, oh, this is gonna this is going off the rails yeah but i mean i guess the point i'm trying to make is that even if he had said she was killed by an illegal immigrant yeah there would still be the backlash right don't you agree i think it is particularly jarring to just call them an illegal like, I it feels no, like I, more I, of a slur I understand that. than you know if you say illegal immigrant I don't know that there would have been as much of a backlash, but I, your I core, think there would have been. But your core point of the fixation on the word versus, you know, even if you just keep it on immigration, the policy itself, you know, the, a bunch of Democrats were running around like they really pulled one over on the Republicans because they put forward. We, we gave them everything they wanted. Yeah, <laughs> draconian immigration bill and completely accepted their framing and are like, we, too, can be fascists at the border and we're just as cruel and assholes as they are. And they thought this was some great victory. Like, focus on that, even if you're just focused on immigration. And then, you know, you put next to it the fact that he's still running cover for a genocide and announcing the most insulting PR bullshit with this whole port, we'll that. port situation, which I know we're going to get to. And that's not your focus right now. Your big criticism of the Biden administration is a word that he used. It is bizarre and pathetic. Well, and also a lot of the same people who are attacking him for saying an illegal Later on in the speech, when Biden did the hypocrisy burn of the right on, I'm actually the one for tough border control and you mm -hmm. guys are not for the bill. Yeah. Those same people were cheering it. Right. So that's the part that's frustrating me. It's right. like, you're going to get mad over the language, but then you're also like, yeah, you should have done Biden's border uh, fascism bill. Right. That doesn't make any sense, no especially sense. in the context of like Agreed. you pointed out and I pointed out that like, yeah, the real thing to be pissed about is the Gaza portion. Right. Uh, so, okay, now... Um, let me go. Let's go to the Gaza portion. And then after that, we'll cut it off. We still have a bunch more clips. You guys are going to want to sign up on Substack to see the rest of this. But this will be the last portion that you see for free in the teaser clip. One more thing on the Republicans on immigration that I just feel needs pointing out, too, is that they like to pretend like Biden is some like open borders, you know, socialist. Which, on is, this, it's which is just a lie. It's just a lie. Like, they, if you just look they at his can't record, even believe that. I know. I, I, I agree. I, I think some parts of the Republican base perhaps have been made to believe it. But just a cursory glance at his record, you know, shows you that it's very far, very far from the truth. So on that level, it's, you know, the whole situation is preposterous, too. Right. All right. So now uh, let's look at the Gaza portion. I'm directing the U.S. military to lead an emergency mission to establish a temporary pier in the Mediterranean on the coast of Gaza that can receive large shipments carrying food, water, medicine, and temporary shelters. No U.S. boots will be on the ground. A temporary pier will enable a massive increase in the amount of humanitarian assistance getting into Gaza every day. <clears throat> and Israel must do its part. Israel must allow more aid into Gaza to ensure humanitarian workers aren't caught in the crossfire. And they're announcing they're going to they're going to cross, have a crossing in northern Gaza. To the leadership of Israel, I say this: humanitarian assistance cannot be a secondary consideration or a bargaining chip. Protecting and saving innocent lives has to be a priority. As we look to the future, the only real solution to the situation is a two-state solution over time. <clears throat> and I say this, as a lifelong supporter of Israel, my entire career, no one has a stronger record with Israel than I do. I challenge any of you here. I'm the only American president to visit Israel in wartime. But there is no other path that guarantees Israel's security and democracy. There is no other path that guarantees that Palestinians can live in peace with, with peace and dignity. And there's no other path that guarantees peace between Israel and all of its neighbors. Now, before that portion that you just saw, there was a very long, like, prelude to it. Yep. All about October 7th and Hamas, the terrorist group, and Israel defending itself. Mm -hmm. And I remember when I was watching that portion, my blood was boiling. Then he hits you with what you just heard. Yeah. And it's such fucking chicken shit because 
it's just PR ass covering. Mm -hmm. Oh, we're going to build a port, which is probably going to take at least two months yeah. longer, even if everything goes perfectly. There are people, hundreds of thousands or millions, starving right now. Yeah. Two million Gazans are homeless. We are giving the money and the weapons to Netanyahu as he's doing an ethnic cleansing and a genocide. There was an article that came out the other day. We've sent weapons to Israel over a hundred times. That's right. Throughout this process. Okay. If you wanted to stop that, you would cut off the money, cut off the weapons, condemn them at the UN, sanction them, and there's all the international pressure you need. Everybody knows the story about mm -hmm. Ronald Reagan calling up the Israeli prime minister when they're carpet bombing Lebanon and saying, you're doing a Holocaust, stop it. And then 20 minutes later, they fucking stopped it. Yeah. Everybody knows the story about George H.W. Bush conditioning $10 billion in loan guarantees to Israel on the condition that they free settlement building. You know what they did? They froze settlement building. Yep. We wear the pants. We're the boss here. We're the superpower. But he ain't fucking acting like it. He's acting like he's cucking himself to Netanyahu while trying to do PR ass covering because that's exactly what he is doing. Well, he's not acting like it because he actually supports what Netanyahu is doing. Correct. I mean, if he wanted to stop it, he would stop it. So... He's under enough pressure domestically. They've sort of woken up to the fact that this whole situation is a disaster for him politically. And so rather than actually changing the policy and ending the genocide, which could be done and anyone gaslighting you into thinking like, oh, he's doing all he can, complete and utter bullshit. Rather than doing that, they're going to try to change the messaging. And so they sent in these little piddly, pathetic uh, airdrops of aid. And now this ridiculous boondoggle, expensive, risky boondoggle of this port that's going to take months to construct. And by the way, has all the same issues that, you know, that you have right now with getting trucks in. It's still going to be Israel who is responsible for checking this aid. And we have no idea how it's going to be distributed. So it's just it's so insane and insulting on so many levels. I don't think that anyone who cares about this issue is fooled by it whatsoever. But they've realized that, all right, we got to change. They think they can get away with just changing the language and pretending like saying the word ceasefire, like appropriating that language. For six weeks. Even as what they mean is not a ceasefire. It's he's, He says we need an immediate ceasefire for at least six weeks. Which means what happens after those six weeks, Joe? The genocide starts What again. happens after those six weeks, That's Joe? Right. That's right. That's right. What are we talking about here? And I love, notice the specific language, too, when he says... We need a two-state solution over time. Mm -hmm. Oh, over time. Right. Has it not been enough time already? Yes. Have Palestinians not been suffering for long enough already? Over time? You know what they mean. What they mean is we want to come up with some bull— And this is liberal Democrats uh, who have a slightly different view than the right in Israel. But what they want is effectively like a Bantustan version of a Palestine— where they don't have any sovereignty, any independence, any right to self-defense. That's right. People always talk about, oh, Israel's right to self-defense. Do, do Palestinians have a right to self-defense? So that's what they want to do. So it's this sort of bullshit, less than a state thing. And he wants that over time. Yeah. Spare me. The framing from the jump, too, you talked about the long like buildup about October 7th and Hamas terrorism, mm -hmm. et cetera. The framing is, I have the uh, remarks in front of me, this crisis began on October 7th. Insane. With a massacre by the terrorist Insane. group Hamas. Insane. Like, that's Insane. the first thing that Insane. ever happened. Yeah. And so that, I mean, even just starting there... It tells you everything about the framing. I saw some reporting last night that allegedly Netanyahu and the Israelis were pissed that he uh, used the Hamas casualty numbers of 30,000 oh. dead, which is probably, I, I mean, I think that's probably a wild understatement, too, at this point. We know from Euro uh, rights, Euro rights, Med Monitor, yeah. Euro Med Monitor, that, um, you know, they count also those estimated to be buried under the rubble. But even that, I think at this point, is probably an undercount because it's just chaos there. How can you know the toll? Did you see what Ralph Nader said? He released yeah. a long thing where he said, I think the actual number dead is about 200,000, 200, which is there's a big gap between Euro Med Monitor says 39,000. He says 200,000, even if the truth is somewhere in the middle. Right. It's, uh, it's Let's say 60,000. An unbelievable. It's, it's literally a genocide. We I, are witnessing a genocide. He's arming it. He's funding it. He's responsible for it. And at this point, if you, you can't shove your head in the sand about it anymore, you just can't do it. Babies are dying from starvation every single day, every day every single day like that's where we're at and it's because of our policy i mean we're 
you know, nearly as culpable as Israel because we're the ones that give them the green light. We're the ones that give them the weapons. We're the ones that give them the diplomatic cover. We are as complicit in this as we could possibly be. And for him to, instead of saying, let's end the bombing to stop the suffering, it's let's over months risk our own soldiers and spend our own money to build some bullshit port. It's just, it's disgusting. It's I don't, I, it's idiotic, it's absurd, it's preposterous, it's morally bankrupt, it's insane. It's an insane response. And I want to give a shout out to Summer Lee, yep. Ilhan Omar, and Rashida Tlaib, yep. who all were, wore kafayas. Yeah. And they were holding up signs that said, um, stop sending bombs and like lasting ceasefire lasting now. Ceasefire. I want to give them a tremendous amount of credit because that's brave in yeah. the belly of the beast, knowing that you're going to be the target of like $15 million in APAC money trying to take your ass down. That's brave. It's also brave. Shout out to every single one of those protesters who tried to block his route. Shout out to all the protesters who went to Adam Schiff's event and yep. shouted his punk ass down. Yep. Shout out to all the protesters who went to the Kirsten Gillibrand event and shouted her ass down. These people, it's just like with George W. Bush and with Dick Cheney, where we all agreed they shouldn't get a moment of peace the rest of their lives. Nope. At the very least, they should be absolute national pariahs where they feel like I can't go to the store and buy milk and bread without people coming up and yelling at me and calling me a war criminal. Yep. The exact same thing applies in this scenario. If they're not going to be locked up in prison for the rest of their lives, as they deserve to be for what's going on here, then God bless all the people who are trying to make their lives a living hell. At the very least, I want it so that when these people put their head down on their pillows at night, they feel like, Jesus fucking Christ, what have I done? What have I done? to garner this reaction. I don't know if they have that much of a soul left. Well, but I like that people are trying to force them to have a realization yeah, of what the fuck they are. Feel some discomfort. Um, also shout out to all the people who've been voting uncommitted. We had the Hawaii caucus results. That 30, was big. 30% for uncommitted. Was I was big. trying to just look up. I think there's uh, 20 plus uncommitted delegates now to the DNC. And obviously there's still a lot more states to vote. So, yo, know, it's, it's encouraging that it is inspiring to see the number of people who still have a soul and can look at these images and say this is absolutely unacceptable. Like yeah. We have to do whatever we can to stop this. And, you know, I I never could. Uh, I guess this is uh, was a failure of imagination, but I just never could have imagined that we could watch this genocide genocide unfold on social media. And for this many months, just not just allow it to happen, but to actively facilitate it, run cover for it. It's Unreal. It's an eye-opening moment so for a lot of people. So yeah. radical. Oh, absolutely. So radicalizing. Absolutely. And and that's the piece that, like, you know, it really is difficult for me to evaluate the rest of the speech talking about, like, junk bees. and Yeah, for good know, reason. I mean, for not, good reason. And I'm not saying those things aren't important. I'm not saying that, you know, the economic suffering of people here isn't important. Obviously, that's incredibly important. Like, that suffering is very real as well. But when you're watching these babies being starved, when you're watching their entire, you know, the entire Gaza Strip destroyed, no civilian infrastructure left, people have no homes, they're completely displaced, they're clustered in Rafah and now there's threatened, you know, and, and they're already bombing Rafah, but threatened invasion there too. The number of hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people whose lives are literally at risk right now, it's just hard to get those things out of your head. Yeah, it feels a little bit like saying Himmler was for paid family leave. Right. right? Like, like, that's what uh, it feels like at this point. You know what I mean? So it's understandable that our reaction is what it is. Yeah. Uh, all right. But we're going to switch gears here now, guys. Guys, we still have a bunch of clips to get to. Um, do us a favor. If you want to see the rest of this, sign up on Substack. You got the link below. Um, if you sign up and pay five dollars a month, you get the video of every show and you'll get the video for this. You'll get it the same day, usually a day early. You can also sign up for free if you want to hear the audio version. And that usually comes out a day later. Uh, it's sent right to your email inbox, just the audio podcast if you want to do it that way so there's a free option there's a five dollars a month option uh thank you to everybody who does support this show because we've never had a conversation with any advertiser we take no ad money for this at all Th this show is all funded through small dollar donations so everybody who's paying that uh five bucks a month you guys are, are funding this show um thank you very much we love you guys everybody uh hang around check it out because we're about to go into a whole bunch more clips and i saved some good ones